Good morning. Thank you for your patience. Um, it is an absolute honor to be here. I have to, to say that this is, um, once again, I apologize that I cannot do this in Norwegian, um, and frankly, people might wonder whether I can do it in English, but uh, if for some reason I start talking very quickly, if you could just sort of look horrified, that, that would work. Um, I have to start with a personal story, uh, because this trip has been a bit of a sort of bookends from the beginning of my career to this career. Um, in, in, on January 13th, so two weeks ago, not only did I get on a plane that took me to the Netherlands and began this trip, but it was my 50th birthday. So um, when one turns 50, one spends some time thinking about exactly what you've been doing with those 50 years. Um, and this was, this was me in 2003 in a virtual records test conference, um, standing up and speaking. This was me uh, two days ago in front of the new um, Oslo Public Library they're building. And I think we can all agree that uh, library science is not, not that good for me. It's not, <laughs> there's, there's been some changes along the way. I clearly blame my career and my children. I blame my children. Um, but it, it really is interesting because at one time, this project and what we're talking about as information consultants, what we're talking about is the future of reference and reference libraries. And that's where I spent a lot of time early on with a project like Ask Eric, with the virtual reference desk and quality measures for virtual reference services. I remember talking about national reference services, what started as the CDRS, the Library of Congress is answering between question point and starting up statewide networks and all of these things. And then I, you know, have also been working very much on what libraries look like when they're around learning in communities, not just in public libraries, but all kinds of libraries. And to many people, it feels like two different streams. Like, all right, look at reference, now it's looking at this. And to me, they're very much the same. And so I really appreciate the opportunity today to talk about a little about where they came from and what we've learned about reference, but then bring in the idea of how does thinking radically different about librarianship change that information consulting function? How does it change when we look at the library as the community? When we look at our main role as making community smarter by meaning and not answering questions, not sitting at desks. So, with that, I'm going to begin a very quick trip through history, and then hopefully we can get into the more interesting stuff. So, in the beginning, there we go, reference was created back in the good old days, like in the late 1800s, early 1900s, as an alternative to the catalog. The understanding was that we had these beautiful collections, and we had these beautiful, literally, physical catalogs, even before card catalogs, the inventory lists. And unfortunately, the, the people who would come into the library weren't smart enough to figure it out, so let's give them a human voice. Reference, as we originally thought about it, the reference library began as an alternative interface to the catalog. And in fact, sometimes that still happens. If you think about our catalogs and how people find materials and resources, it's built for us. When we look at online systems, they're built for libraries. There's study after study that shows that when people go to find a book or a piece of material in a catalog, they find it very difficult. And yet when librarians do it, they find it very easy. This says, who did we build this for? And so reference became a sort of escape valve, which is if you couldn't handle the systems, you couldn't handle the catalog, fine, we'll give you a person to do it. And so originally, it was very much about an alternative interface, and that's when we began introducing this whole sort of genre of materials around quick facts and standards and calling them reference resources. And one of the, the common themes, skipping ahead, that we've seen through the 80s and 90s is when people would talk about reference, when you looked at reference sections of library associations, almost all of the awards and, you know, and, and grants and committees were geared on the books. They were geared on reference books. What's a good reference book? What's a bad reference book? And not on human to human interaction. So this is where we sort of begin, which is the question was help. 
I mean, it was basically it was our version of Clippy before Microsoft talked about it. Zoom ahead to 1968 when um, Robert Taylor wrote his seminal work on question negotiation, and we began to say, you know, it's, it's something going on here besides people just asking us questions. You know, how are they asking questions? What should we do with it? And so Bob Taylor really began looking at the reference interaction. He's an information person. He looked at it as an information problem solving. It was in people's heads. And he said, it's not just a question. We know, for example, that if you're, if you're thinking about building services, the words people give you, which is the question, are almost useless. <laughs> yeah, uh, we were just mentioning over the break that I had one reference librarian describe reference as putting the patron on the rack until they told you the truth. Right? Like, I would like books on nutrition. No, you don't. Yes, yes, I want books on nutrition. No, you don't. Yes, I want to know about good nutrition. No, you don't. Well, what do I want? Your fat. You want to lose your fat. You want a dieting book to work here. Right? <laughs> Nutrition, fine, good luck, right? And then, by the way, if, if we're going to just spend a little bit of time on, on different types of reference libraries, the, my favorite reference library is the greedy reference library. The greedy le reference library is the one that will never pass a question off to anyone else. They'll get a question, and by God, they're going to answer that question, right? I mean, it could be something silly like, you know, so, what is David Lycus' social security number? Well, I can ask David, and he can tell me in 10 seconds, but no, I'm going to go hack into his computer and figure it out. <laughs> These are the same people that, when, when they come up to the, someone comes up to the desk and they ask a question, and you give them an answer, and they say thank you, and they start walking away, you're like, but also this one, and they thank you, and no, really, and they're like chasing the people outside of the library, throwing citations at them, knowing that one of these will stick. So Rob Taylor really invented what we would think about reference today, the idea of a reference interview. And what Bob Taylor, one of his major things he said, those questions, the words that people use. I mean, there's study after study that those words are misleading. Give you an example from an academic study. A PhD student at the beginning of their studies walks into an academic library, they're studying, you know, something Viking. And so, I would give that more detail, but then I would just embarrass myself. So um, they come in and they ask me a question, because they're thinking about doing a dissertation, like, can you tell me everything you know about this topic? And what they're saying is, I really want to know everything, because I'm starting. I want to sort of swim in this information, and I want to begin to think about it, and that would begin to formulate into questions, and that would eventually turn into a thesis. The same doctoral student will walk in up to the library like the day before they defend their dissertation and they will ask the exact same question. Tell me everything you know about Vikings. Why? They're not looking to start again. What they're looking to do is, did I miss something? Right? Because by God, that professor, I see we have at least two or three in the audience, they're out to get me. And the way they're going to do it is they're like, well, you forgot to read this one. Then. <laughs> I was actually at a dissertation defense once. And um, the question was, so, from the professor, so as I'm reading, uh, reviewing an article that hasn't been printed yet, they said the following. How do you respond to that? <laughs> and again, it's like, how do I respond to an article that hasn't been written yet? <laughs> so, but the thing is, they really need different things underneath, and you have to figure it out. So what Bob Taylor said is, people don't ask questions. They start with what he called the visceral question. This is where you walk away and you just have something that scratches your mind. I wonder what's missing? What am I not figuring out? It then becomes a conscious question. It moves from this sort of missing to, oh, I really need to know more about where to eat when I'm, when I'm, in, uh, I'm in, uh, in Oslo, for example. And then what happens is they, they now go conscious, but they need to be in the formula, right? Which is, well, I need to know where to eat, but I'm interested in this kind of food, I'm interested in this kind of time. And finally, it can become what's called the compromise move. That is, when I actually ask it of uh, a reference like I I have to use language that may not be comfortable or known to them. I have to figure out how to put it into a system. Right? So it goes through all these steps. 
And then what, what Taylor said is that you then have these filters that reference library should run things through. And this begins to talk about how reference is changing. Because he said the first thing you want is the character of the search. What is the sort of genre? What, is, what are they looking for? What is the user's interest? What is their motivation? Now what's interesting is he would say it's important to know their motivation, and yet much of library reference instructions never ask people why they need to know. And yet we need to know, right? Is this for a class project? Is this for a vacation? Is this for a thesis? Is what is it for? Then the relationship of that question to the catalog. Because when Taylor is writing this in 1968, the resources that librarians would use to answer their questions were the materials behind them. This is connects back to the idea that we are an alternative interface. So I can't help you if I don't have a book, a subscription, a data that's on it. Right? And then finally, what, what are they looking for in the answer? Now we can update this because now it's, but it, it, it suddenly means nothing in the sense of instead of looking, well, do we have this material? And your entire collection is the entire internet as well as all the materials you have. You know, is it really going to limit things? It's me. It's my magical powers. <laughs> Making sure you're still awake, because there's nothing that keeps people awake than hearing about question of negotiation from 1968. <laughs> Skipping ahead quickly then, in 1981, Brenda Durbin developed something called open questioning and began... I told you it was a bad idea to build the library on a Viking burial ground. <laughs> That's just a movie waiting to happen. All right, so as long as you're not epileptic, we're going to continue. Durbin went in there and said, by the way, it's important not only from this person and the questions they may have, but you as the librarian, how you ask those questions. Right? You have to ask questions to assess the situation. You have to assess the gaps. This is really the evolution of question negotiation or the reference interview, which, by the way, all our data shows no one ever does. But that idea that you really needed to understand the person and have them fully explore what they're doing. Now, in 1999, Marie Radford really did some amazing work. She's still doing some amazing work on reference encountering. And what she said is, it's not just about how to get this person to confess the truth. It's not just about getting them. It's also about the, the relationship you build. This concept that reference used to be this anonymous function, that you're not supposed to share names, you're not like supposed to remember people's questions all over time, and they're very secure. We know that's not true. And what Marie's reference said is that's not the language you use, the wording you use, the social cues that you use, all of this becomes important in doing your job. That this is a social interaction as much as an information transaction. She really began to move the idea of reference from a thing we do once to a relationship that we create, even though it might be in a very short time span, but it can span over long periods of time. In 1998-2003, we had projects like the Virtual Reference Desk, the rise of ASCA services, um, and that, that comes from, in the English, things like ASCA volcanologist, ASCA mathematician. My, my two favorite ASCA services of the, of the early or late 90s, one was, uh, one probably won't make much sense. Do you know who the Amish are? There was a, wait for it, email reference service to ask the Amish. <laughs> How do you turn butter? How do I use a computer? It was one of them. And then I sat there like across the street. I can only imagine they would get the questions, print them out, write them in old English, and walk across and go, How do you turn butter? And I don't know. <laughs> the other one, the other one was um the other my other favorite terms was ask a locksmith. Now, there are, I think the two questions I have to imagine that box we've got over and over again is one, how do I pick a lock? In which case, you're an accessory to a crime. And the second is, I lock inside my house, how do I get out? <laughs> you lose your keys, you walk up to your door, you're locked out, you're like, what do I do now? I know, I bring up my laptop and I ask the virtual reference service to wait 24 hours to get into my house. So, this was the crazy time. We treated people as questions. This is when 
And this is important for today. This is when, remember the dot com boom? Right? Some of you are just young, I know, 50s, right? But this was when like, anything that had dot com was going to make a million dollars in the public. There were at least four different services that sought to create a four feed reference function. The idea is that you would send in your question. To get the answer, they would charge you for the answer. So you would send in a question. They'd say, oh, it's $5. You'd say, great. Can't wait to get the answer. You get the answer. The best part is they all began with the idea of when you would ask the question, if you could let us know if it's a hard question or an easy question. <laughs> How many reference librarians have spent hours on an easy question? The example I love, uh, is, I heard it on, on radio, it was a librarian early in her career, she had a, an eight-year-old come up and ask, do clams sleep? <laughs> now this was before Google. This was way before even the internet was something that they could use, and it said it took her 14 years to finally find the answer. <laughs> She found an oceanographer who worked at like the Scripps Institute. He goes, well, they go through a period of dormancy. <laughs> and I, by that point, the eight-year-old is like, you know, probably the oceanographer herself. And I couldn't answer that question. Right? That idea, because we thought that questions were this nice little piece of quantum, this nice little thing that we could take and we could count and we could pass around and we could share, but it's not. A question is really just a pro part of a larger process of making meaning, finding the world. We saw the rise of network services like Question Point, State Point Networks. In 2003, reference resources is going to die. And this is, its, this is the call. This is, I want to be really clear. In my career, in looking at reference, in my writing, you will never, ever hear something that says, Google's going to put us out of business. The internet, we don't do libraries anymore. I don't believe it, but what I do know is it changes what we do. Kim Silk was an amazing librarian um, now at, at the Hamilton Library in, um, in Canada. She said Google is the greatest thing to happen to reference librarians ever because it completely solved, almost completely solved, the document delivery problem. And we don't even think about it these days. When someone comes and asks a question, you go know, click, 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 here, it book material, URL, reference, etc. Back in the day, it was click, 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 ah, I found the document, it's on microfiche, and it's in another country. Come back in four months, and we will have a black and white copy of something that you no longer remember what you asked. This changed how we did our job. It brought the world in. And in the process, it made every resource every book, every digitized resource, a ready reference material. We can search across this. And this fundamentally stopped the conversation about what's a really good gazetteer, what's a fabulous encyclopedia. Internet has changed that part of our world. Now I'm going to skip a little bit for a moment and now look at a parallel track that's going to go ahead and smash into the two. And that's the idea of the libraries of community hub. As reference has gone through this evolution from alternative interface to introducing a reference interview to now a social experience to doing it online electronically, something was happening with libraries. Libraries have begun to evolve from what is their primary mission and in so doing have evolved in how they look at things. The primary mission of libraries, particularly in the early 1900s, and even up until, I would say, well into the 70s, was literacy. Our primary purpose was to help people read or to help people study a hard topic. And it was seen, there was this notion that we get you the material you love, the reader's advisor. We help you figure out what reading you should do on a topic, reference interviews. We help you explore a topic in depth, reference to consultation. And what happens, though, is as we move into the 80s, well, first of all, as we move into the 80s, we become information houses. And so the information movement, now what we're doing is people are basically, we're the interface, they're users. By the way, I know this is an English thing and not a Norwegian thing. Don't call them users. Um, in English, what that means is you use someone. And I don't like being used. Okay? There are neighbors. 
there are patrons, there are, there are friends, there are colleagues, there are fellow citizens, there are certainly not customers. But the information aspect, where he said, well, now we're looking at them as information query, information problem solving, and we provide information, and we treated people like they were information processing units. What do I have to put into this processing unit to get the answer or the result I want? And what we're finding increasingly as we moved into the 2000s is that function didn't work out. As we looked at numbers of people coming to the library, we began realizing they weren't coming to the library to have their information problem solved. They were coming to the library to be in the library, they were coming to the library to be with others in the library, and they were seeking to make meaning of their life. This is when we began talking about libraries, by the way, public libraries, but also academic libraries, special libraries, primary and secondary school libraries, as the third space, Oldenburg's concept. My guess is, you have probably heard to the point that you are really done with it about the third space, and being the third space, and what is the third space. And we've used all different kinds of language. We're the community's living room. We've used the people's university. We've used, well, we've become coffee houses. We don't actually call ourselves that, right? But we've realized that libraries are places of creation. Now, that could be things like maker spaces and performance spaces, podcasting, and such, but it's ultimately making me and me learn. We'll talk about that in a moment. Right? And we began looking at the community not just as something that we serve, but something that was part of us. And it seems trivial, but a clear example of that is through things like shared collections, baking shared collections. So, once again, I apologize, a little cultural moment if you really want to understand how horrible Americans are. I know you already understand that, but we have children and they want birthdays, and when they have birthdays, they get birthday cakes. They don't want like the round cake with whatever. They want Elmo. They want some cream. They want something ridiculous, right? And so you buy these specially made cake bags, right? And you bake them in and flip them over, and there's Elmo, and you spend a half an hour trying to ice them, and you made an Elmo cake. Your eight-year-old comes in, they go Wee! and completely ignored for the rest of their life. And then when you go to make an Elmo cake for their next birthday, they go, oh, Elmo, I'm so done with Elmo. I am not a child, right? So that just means that in the United States, and I, just, I, I believe this is a real statistic, nine out of 10 households are inundated with pans that they never will use again of funny characters. And so the question is, what do you do with an Elmo cake? What do you do with it? Well, they begin bringing it to the library and said, does anyone else want to have Elmo cake? Why are they buy this? and created shared collections. Now, you're saying, really? Yeah. And in fact, I was just in the Netherlands and they were talking about seed collections. The idea that people would bring in seeds, they would borrow seeds, they would grow, they would grow from them, and they would actually replace the seeds. And so you got seed collections. You got these different things. Human libraries built on that, where the community becomes the collection. It's a place of sharing of resources and creating. And the literacy as a mission becomes community development. It's no longer about having one-on-one -on -one people read, it's about helping a community make smarter decisions, get more informed. And that, increasingly, to the notion of the library as a democratic instrument. One of the things, you, you really need to realize that from an outsider point of view, how fundamentally interesting, impressive, and, and forward-thinking it is that you, in your enabling library legislation, have the notion that libraries are places of democratic and we need debates and meetings. That is spectacular. I believe Finland also has that. I've seen that nowhere else. That idea that we seek to be a democratic organization, that we want the people who govern themselves to be well informed and smart. Right? We end up with a new library formula. In the old, and this is, these are some statistics, this is actually, as I was talking briefly with the director of the new uh, Oslo Public Library, and we were talking, they moved from, in the old building, 70% of that space was reserved for the work of librarians. Librarian offices, storage space, processing space, sorting, cataloging, behind the scenes stuff. 30% was available to the public in the form of reading rooms and such. In the new one, it's exactly the opposite. 70 to 80% of the library is now dedicated to the public, and 20 to 30% for librarian space. 
What's happening is, and it's not that we've become much more productive, like our screens have gotten smaller, or so have we've gotten smaller, and clearly over 50 years I have not gotten smaller. It's that we realize that what's happening in a community view, when we look at the role of the library, not as a bunch of materials and professionals informing people, but if we look at the library as a community educating itself, of which we are part of that process, you need more public spaces. Library after library after library have been opening up spaces. Just going through to the local um, library here, that notion of taking what was, you know, room. Many of you, some of you had Viking meals last night, right? Apparently it used to be a store. Now it's a place where people can come and put on performances or have talks. What well, were we'll places for sacks became places of convenience? We started talking about living rooms. What was happening is not only did not we, we understood the libraries the public anymore, it's the libraries were leaving the library. We realized to do our work, we didn't need this big tool. This big tool is needed by the community. We could do our work with a laptop, a phone, a cell phone connection, and we could go out and be within the community. We could do small pop-up branches. We could be at services. We could be at different areas, and we could do that work, and so therefore the formula changed. The boundaries of the library are now the boundaries of the internet. Wherever there's an internet connection, we can be there. I mean, it's a really bad for the Catholics in the audience, you know, wherever three of you are, in, but hotspots. One of the things that we're seeing in the US is loading out hotspots. The notion that people can go and bring the internet to their living room. And so in New York City, Manhattan, people think it is very connected. But there are over 250,000 people that live on the island of Manhattan that do not have access to the internet at home. Can't afford it. So what happens is the New York Public Library loaned them internet hotspots. They can bring the internet home, set it up, and they can then have an internet connection for doing work, study, etc. In South Carolina, in South Carolina, which is a rural state, there are people that take two hours a day just to get to school, and two hours to get home from school. Right? They have to go through buses and such, it's a huge distance. At the same time, South Carolina has been moving increasingly to digital efforts, like in normal. So students have iPads instead of books. Their testing is online, their homework is online. They're driving two hours a day to get home. They get home into the middle of nowhere where they don't have internet connection. It's not even an option. And so what they've done is they've set up those rural students who already have problems to fail even more. So what they've done in South Carolina is not send home hotspots, because even the hotspots don't have enough distance. They've wired with the school buses. So the school buses become mobile internet sites, so the two-hour trip to and from school can be used to catch up to the work and do online. So where is to that the school library can be there? The school library can be on that bus. They can search databases, they can consult with teachers, they can consult with librarians. When the, the people in Manhattan put the hotspot on, turn it on, the library is there. And I think from simple as when you connect to it, you should bring up a page and say, hi, I'm your librarian, how can I help you? What resources are here, what's happening? So we're moving out. What we know in reference is community reference. We need to go to the conversation. Great story about a big librarian sitting at a desk waiting for questions is nothing new. Chuck McClure in the 80s did studies around the famous 55% rule. That is, if you look at how many of the correct answers we get, it was like 55% were, were correct, meaning a lot weren't. Right? He also, in that same study, noted that, for example, um, he would be in a room like this, lots of people working, the reference librarian behind the desk like this, nothing going on. It'd be me, right? I'm the reference librarian. Right? My shift would be over, I'd get up to leave, Britt would come sit down, and suddenly people would crowd to the desk. Because Britt was the smart, nice one. And Dave was the mean, ugly one. Right? <laughs> that interpersonal connection is going on. Well, we need to go where those conversations are. How do we do that? Because I get this question a lot, which is, okay, Dave, I'll leave the building to do reference. Does that mean I just wander the streets asking people? No. <laughs> That'd be kind of weird, wouldn't it? Like you're walking out, excuse me, I know you're in a hurry. What is your question? <laughs> I think they're like, my question is, who the hell are you? 
And, and when did your medication run? <laughs> so what do we do? How do we send people out of the building? How do we get them out working? And the answer is we give them something to do. We invent them in practice. So I told the story before where a records librarian began sitting in on a chamber of commerce uh, meetings, and they just sat. And then they noticed that while they're there, questions would come up, they began answering the questions. And then they became something that the people in the chamber would expect the library to be there, so they'd have questions waiting. And finally, she, had, she was elected as the president of the chamber of commerce because they were so vital. That's one example. Other examples, though, are being embedded in projects. So, um, right next to the Oslo, New Oslo Public Library is the Munch Museum. Thank you. Pardon my pronunciation. Um, all right. How many people were involved in that? And you say, well, the museum community and the architects, but is there a place for the librarians to be? How can we bring that communication? Well, I was, once again, very lucky to have a visit of the Viking experience at the Midgard Museum. It's not a huge place, but if someone comes through there and they begin to have questions, yes, there are curators or people who can answer questions about the experience, but what if the questions lead to other things? Are we working with them so that we can take those questions and be in those places as well? Can we look, for example, as City Hall does census data and collects statistics and begins to understand the services, where are the librarians sitting working in those teams, embedded in those teams? as we're working on revitalizing the, the ocean front, as we work on thinking about new use of land regulations, as we work on all of these things, as we work on new plays being put on. Are the libraries there prepared to have those answers and questions? I was just in, in Cincinnati, Ohio with my mother for, for Christmas. We went to see Charles Dickens' at Christmas Day. And what's amazing is next to it was this huge exhibit, including, if you're interested in this, this is the book that was based on here, other books by Dickens, here's other materials you can read on, and if you have questions of exactly what this was, we can answer them here. They worked with the library to take the event and turn it into a community learning experience. How do we do that? Prisoner reintegration. By the way, I, this is where I really show my Americanness. I apologize. But when we will throw by two open prisons, and Fritz says something like, yes, the gate's open, but they don't go out. <laughs> what? It's like you haven't, you know, put them in small boxes and punish them for being you and me who never be redeemed again and they were dead? How could you do that? Do they arm them with guns at least? Everyone's got to be armed with guns. All right. I take a moment. What we see is, for example, in the uh, Cuyahoga County Library in Ohio, there's a prison library and it works with the public library, so as, to, as you know, resources and materials. But as an inmate is about to be released, they work with the prison library to set up a meeting. So on Thursday after you're out, you're going to go meet with your public library. That public library is going to help you find housing, number one reason for recidivism. They're going to help you find jobs and have a clip of jobs and update your skills. They're going to talk about different community groups you can reach out to, and they're going to be a face that you know, so if you run into a problem, you can go there. Being in the prison allows them to be in the building, which allows them to make a better community. So, the other thing that we learned in all of this is that third space, and providing the third space, has always been seen as being social. And there's this underlying, the word competition really bothers me in many cases. But the notion that we're competing with online world, we're competing with Google, you're not competing with Google, you will lose. Because Google can present ads, can present them in 10 milliseconds, and can give people focus information. This is not the competition you want to win. It's a different thing. But what we realize is that you know, people are going online and using Facebook, people are building these kinds of experiences, not just because they want to be social, as an introvert and an antisocial person, I can guarantee that. But they're seeking to learn. People are learning machines. When you look at what they do in the world, they learn. Individuals seek meaning. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? How do I find my, my self-worth? And power to learn. They're seeking to improve their status. They're seeking to improve their life, whether it's financially, whether it's educationally, whether it's basic things like, how do I get off the streets? That's what people are trying to do. 
Learning is a construction and refinement of a worldview through a series of conversations with the self and others. Learning is about talking to yourself, hopefully not out loud in public spaces, but it's that thing where you sit there and go, do I believe that, do I not believe that? Well, that reminds me of that internal dialogue is learning. And they're doing it through conversations with the librarian, with their neighbor, with their friend. We know, for example, that with virtual reference services, people are much more willing to go to their friend for an answer than someone who I actually know. I mean, it's like, you know, does this lump look cancerous to you? And they're sitting there going, I don't know, I work at McDonald's, and um, they didn't teach us that. That's what we do. Because we, we go to places that are trusted. Right? And we trust them. And what we know is that librarians are trusted because they're not that they have the right answer, but because they listen, they attempt to do it, and they do it in a clear way. Learning is an act of creation, and it is always participatory. It is always participatory. When you're talking to yourself, you're talking to others, you want to control your learning situation. If you remember your worst college class, my guess, besides the fighting really hard, is it would have the fewest number of opportunities to ask questions, it had the fewest number of opportunities to help to organize and be creative in your assignments. There was something that basically stopped you. You didn't feel you could participate in it. Right? And that memory is a collection of these agreements in context that evolve over time. Now, the reason I bring all this up is that what the library has become, of which reference is a part, is a movement. It's no longer the living room, it's no longer the hub, it's no longer that place with materials. It's a social movement. The libraries shape functions of our institutions that are unique to our communities. What is happening is that our libraries are looking less and less like each other and more and more like the people who come in. I remember the days when the Scandinavian libraries would do projects in Africa and they would build libraries in Africa and they would build Scandinavian libraries in Africa. Now that doesn't just mean it's had a lot of wood, but it is the idea that it yeah, had a desk, it had reference, it was done by the big decimal system, people would come in and use it, and it didn't necessarily reflect the fact of what they're doing. So my favorite sub-Saharan Africa library is in Kenya. And in Kenya, they're in the middle of a sort of building new buildings. Where they can't get buildings, they're building donkey carts that bring books and materials out to communities. But in the north, in the Sahara Desert, where the donkeys are going to go, they're bringing camels. The camels are the library branches of these tribal communities. They come in, they set up a tent, they set up, they set up that, they have materials, but they begin talking, working, teaching literacy to people in these different tribal communities by invitation. What does your library look like and what does your community look like? Because they can be very different and they should be very different. And so, what happens is our job as professionals is to knit together the profession and services for that community. This is the old way, I'm really clear, not this. The old way of doing librarianship is we did a big study, we had a service that was a success. We wrote the toolkit, we bring it over to your library and say, if you want to do it, here's the toolkit. The problem is, does your community look the same? Is it the same size? Does it have the same demographic breakdown? Does it have the same issues? Does it have the same real estate available? Does it have the same culture? The way to do it now is you, with context, adapt it to what you're doing. Come up with new ideas. And as a professional, as a librarian, you then knit them together. So you sit between Tungberg and Oslo and say, what works, what doesn't? Let's be librarians. We connect back and forth. But then we go to our communities, and they look very different. A hotspot learner program in uh, New York City and a wired school bus in South Carolina are both the same idea, provide internet access, but they're done very differently based on the local needs of the community. But they're both of what librarians should be doing to connect. New, the two new skills for librarians, we used to think it was information seeking, information organization, is facilitation and advocacy. A reference transaction is like a mini class. Think about it as an instructional class. 
And we need to do activities and bring people together. And we have to realize that the phrase, how can I help you, may be the most arrogant phrase that a librarian can say. Right? Because it's hard when you read it, it looks very neutral. And when you say it, it sounds very cheery. How can I help you? What is the Norwegian equivalent of how can I help you? Hmm? Yeah. 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 You do not want this map destroying your life. <laughs> but, so, because it, it, it often gets interpreted as, how can I, the library, <laughs> master of this great glass cathedral that we are in, owner of this desk, <laughs> struggler with degree, how can I help you? <laughs> you, who don't even know what you need, you poor slob who can't even communicate the most of What What question? Nutrition books. <laughs> I have thousands of nutrition books. Would you like me? Master of my domain. Holder of the nutrition books. To recommend one? That's kind of where we're going. As opposed to something like, hey, what are you doing? How can I be part of what you're doing? What are you learning about today? What's getting you excited about? Because that's the question. When people come to us, you know, you can read Desk Set, you watch Desk Set all you want. Catherine Hepburn can tell us about curfew coming tonight. You know, it's not true. We never know everything. That's not our power. Our superpower is not knowing everything. Our superpower is sitting with someone and working together to figure out what, how we can push them forward, how we can change what they know. And maybe that's a tool, and maybe that's a resource, but maybe it's a friend, and maybe it's a buddy. Because reference is not dead. Reference is evolving. This is absolutely an excuse for me to put up beautiful pictures of dinosaurs with feathers, but I'm stealing it. For those of you who have not been paying attention, birds or dinosaurs, that's what they evolved into. For those of you who don't believe that, I'm sorry. Um, it's not what you believe, it's what happened. Reference isn't dying, it's evolving in construction and learning. Instead of thinking of, our, of ourselves as information consultants that are ready, cool to answer questions, that we're here as a, as a court, and when you ask us a question, we act. It's like a SWAT team. We just come down and we'll get you an answer. The answer is we're here to help you learn. We're teachers. Right? The reason people work. Questions. Remember when I started to say we treated people as questions and we could count them and we could document them and we share them around? The reason that didn't work is because people wanted to learn. If I go back and you look at things like Brenda Durbin's neutral questions and question negotiation, those are just different techniques to go, what are you learning these days? What's the gap in your knowledge? That's what's happening. So why a lot of those virtual reference services set up as a way of answering questions. Their numbers didn't skyrocket through the roof because people were sitting there going, I give you a question, I get an answer. What they were really looking for is I need a connection. I need help in learning. I need you to understand me more. Reference is moving from transactions, here's a question, give me an answer, to relationships. Here's a question, that might turn into a whole curriculum. I mean, literally, that would be, let's learn about plants, let's go visit the aquarium, let's take documentation, let's pull that together. One of the early things we really tried to do was we tried to create databases of questions and answers. And the idea is if we had 300 questions coming in, if we put those into a database, eventually the same questions would come again and again, and we could just send them resources. This is, by the way, 100,000% how customer service phone lines are built. Press one. Right? So take, take my example. Right? I flew from South Carolina to Philadelphia to Amsterdam, to Oslo, and I'm now going to go from Oslo to Heathrow to Philadelphia, and eventually back. I have a problem with my phone, uh, problem with my, my flight, I call up, press one, if this is regards a domestic flight. Press two, if it's an international flight. It's both. Do I press 1.5? <laughs> Do I have them together and press three? <laughs> 
My, my family, so I'm sure you have no problems like this, but in the United States, most of the internet providers come from cable companies, from television providers. Whenever we had a problem, and I had to call up the customer support line, and I'm not making this up, my wife would take the kids out of the house. <laughs> because she knew at some point it was not going to go well. My voice would go up, and I would get very creative with curse words. It would be a very impressive thing. And so that is because people are trying to run you through, well, what about this, what about this, what about this? And you're just like, I want to talk to a person. I want to talk to a person because I can't explain it the way you're asking me. This is the connection we need. It's a relationship. And we, I mean, I, I, we built the software. We built NISO AZ standard on how to represent reference transactions. You can have them all. The first thing we found out when we modeled a reference transaction, it is not question equals answer. It is normally question followed by question, followed by part of the information, followed by more questions, followed eventually by a question, and then followed through a series of answers. You say, what do you mean? Well, someone comes up and you say, I want to know about it. I'll go with Vikings this time. You can use nutrition. I like to know about Vikings. The answer is, well, a Viking is, and then you know, give them a documentary for an hour and a half, right? The response is, well, what about Vikings? And why are you using Vikings? And how, how soon do you need to break? It's a bunch of questions. You're in a transaction. And so, if you're going to build a network up of people answering questions and reference consultation, that network must be a network not only of librarians, but other educators, hobbyists, medical experts, professionals, nurses. Because if someone asks a question about, does that look cancerous to you, our answer shouldn't be, well, have you seen this book on cancer? <laughs> if, if you guys have WebMD, is that right? WebMD, where if you put in any symptom, it's cancer? <laughs> I have a headache. No! <laughs> I had a scratch. Oh, no, no, no. No! Right? That idea of how do we talk to people? How do we build this as a network? Because that's what we need to build. Your network shouldn't be a bunch of librarians where you need answer. It should be a network and a community helping itself answer. So when you get to the Viking question, we met a lot of people last night that know a lot more about it and are busy building ships and exploring that world and understand the folklore and understand the culture or a university professor who's done this or Etc. That's the kind of network we need to build, and that the bill helps us become a community. Because then, in terms of marketing, we don't have to sit there and go to the, the, the citizens of Norway and say, "Please ask the question." Here's a URL you want to know. Please ask the question. What we can do is say, "What's your work on?" And you go, "You know, that's really. Would you be interested in answering other people's questions about that?" Great, you're part of the network, and they're part of the library. And the library becomes this movement of people answering and working together and trying to solve problems. We are outside of the building. We're in those communities, but that's where the library is because that's where the people are. We are building, instead of thinking about building a customer service network, think about building a university. But that costs less and does not have as much bureaucracy. Think about it as this notion, when you assess it, don't just count the number of questions you received or the number of resources you said. You want to know how many lives did you improve? How many degrees did that lead to? How many good choices did that lead to? How many happy children did that lead to? How? That's going to be from a relationship. Model it as a university, not a customer support line. Because eventually if you do get people asking questions about Vikings and nutrition, you can say, you know, I've got another question. Another person is interested in that topic. And they've agreed to be part of the conversation. Here's that conversation. And then the reference librarian is not answering questions. They're facilitating that conversation to make sure it remains civil, to make sure that any misinformation is being identified and corrected. But it's ultimately leading people together. And if that community ends up creating a documentary, a book, a material, that becomes a part of the library and a part of the collection as well. Allow questions to become projects, to become courses link to the catalog and digital collections allowing the community with librarians to write their own story. Because ultimately, the success that you will have is not in the number of questions you answer, but in the strength of the community that you support. The connections of people around this country and around this world connected to learning. 
When I was up in Oslo, and the, the wonderful project that, that um, Ragnar was ahead of looked at libraries and the role in the digital sphere. And one of the findings they found was that as the digital sphere becomes more important, we force people online, we force them to use technology, we push to use technology, they need more and more physical spaces to come and connect and be, be that place. When we're facing global challenges from climate change to migration to xenophobia to the rise of authoritarianism, our communities need us. They need us to not only answer questions, but they need our, to be neighbors. They're not seeking questions, they're seeking meaning and power, and we must help write that narrative. The goal of this project should not just be get more questions. If you want more questions, hook up to a six-year-old that's full of them. What you want is a better community. What you want is a smarter community. What you want is to sit side by side with the Nobel Prize winner and the plumber and the physicist to make them all feel equally valued. Because trust me, when you get reference questions, the plumber will probably be more essential than the Nobel laureate. And that's important, and that's represented, and that's the story we put. In our buildings, outside of our buildings, online, the notion is, what does it mean to live in Norway? What does it mean to be smart in Norway? Where do we want to be? If you want to hold democratic conversations, do not say next Thursday we come in and we'll talk about democracy. Say, what are you struggling with? What's the issues in your home? Connect them to the politicians to answer questions and fact check them. That's it, about connecting people together. That's the future. And so what started as, here's a question, here's how to do a reference interview, here's how to do it online, turned into, here's how this to be a community member questing in a world of more and more pressure, and more and more needs to go online, and more and more anxiety. They need a group of individuals, of professionals, who can facilitate and say, it's okay. We're here to help. But we're also here to learn with you, because you're valuable, and people need to connect and know you're doing that. That may sound simple and abstract, but that's the other, the other thing. I'll leave you with one last fact. That study that Chuck McClure uh, did on reference answers being 55% true, 45% false. They then said, based on the fact that reference librarians were giving out false answers, you would expect people not to be very happy with the service. They found exactly the opposite. They found no matter what the percentage of correct or incorrect answers were, they were 95% satisfied. And they said, the key, now you can't do that too much these days, the key to getting a positive reaction to a reference transaction, and that's for permission, is to do this. Did that help? To be human, to make a connection, and to be concerned and worried about an individual. That's what we all want. So, as you move forward, I want to offer my, whatever I can do in terms of supporting the results of this study and how you build a network together. Um, because we can talk about technology and metadata there, but you are the human brain and value that will make the service successful. Thank you for your time.